The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, because without you, we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for our readings. A reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshiped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen these people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. And of you, I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. A reading from the first letter to Timothy. I am grateful to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, 
making me an example to those who had come to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Good morning. morning. It's a beautiful day, and I'm happy to be alive and in this moment to share it with you. Uh, I'm a bit warm in here, but (laughs) it's all good. Often when I'm thinking about what to share on a Sunday morning with you all, I find myself in somewhat of a conundrum. I may have mentioned this before, often looking for the right story, the right anecdote to talk about, because sometimes I feel like my messages are austere and severe and grave, compelling you to think and reimagine. We hear words like repent or the the hidden wisdom, and I feel a compelling desire to just open us all up to at least what I think is hidden wisdom or, but it's different for a lot of us. But this word repent often seems austere or serious. But in a casual sense or in a soft sense, it simply means to reimagine or to rethink, metanoia in Greek, an after consciousness or an afterthought. It suggests that your mind is made up. And then it asks you to reconsider. Of course, the miracles says something. When I wake in the morning, I should ask myself, what day do I want to have? And then I should ask the Spirit or Holy Spirit, what should I do? What can I see to help me have this day? And then as the day progresses, you may find yourself in emotions of depression or anxiety or distress, some type of angst. And then the Course says, in that moment, you should say to yourself, maybe I have been wrong about what I'm thinking. And why is this a good principle? Because if I'm right and I feel bad, I'm probably going to have to keep feeling bad or feeling the distress, or feeling the anxiety, or feeling the depression, all of those things, that frustration. And when we have frustration, frustration is our psychological body's way of suggesting to us that something that is happening in the world or something in our experience is arguing with what we believe. And oftentimes, because we reach for comfort, We want to be comfortable, especially in 2022. It seems like comfort is the birthright of the American. But not for all Americans. But the dominant idea of the American dream, or maybe even the Christian dream, is that God is here to deliver us. God is here to save us. 
But save us from what? I believe that the gospel of the privileged feels very different than the gospel of the oppressed. Or vice versa, the gospel of the oppressed feels a little different than the gospel of the privileged. I think the gospel text shows us a little of that. When I walked in this morning, I smelled something so familiar. I smell scrambled eggs. I smell, I think, sausage. I don't know, but it felt like it. And I told, I told Harold, I said, man, it smells like 2019 in here. <laughs> it's been a while since we've had that fragrance and so, or that odor, if you would. And so, but imagine if you've been to Pine Bluff, just do this, if you've ever been to Pine Bluff, Arkansas, you ever smell that paper mill? You, you can. You can smell it in Little Rock sometimes. But imagine if that paper mill just profusely just showed up in St. Michael's today. That, you don't want to imagine that, Maria, I saw you. Uh, <laughs> when, when you when, if that paper mill were to come here today, you'd be like, oh man, that beautiful smell of scrambled eggs and sausage and bacon and baked biscuits. I don't know if they're baked, baked biscuits or not, but it would just go away. And so as we look at the, the, the liturgy and the text, I was studying last night in my Bible, this big thing over here. When I was a kid, I'd walk around with the Bible, and people seldom walk in churches with Bibles now. And, but back in the day, I had to know where, like, Jeremiah was. So last night, I was uh, looking for Jeremiah, and I asked a friend, I said, do you know where Jeremiah is? And she said, it's on the left side. <laughs> I said, that's hilarious. I said, so the top of the Bible is the Old Testament. The bottom of the Bible is the New Testament. And so I had to kind of know as a kid where all these books were. So I was looking for Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah is not listed in the liturgy, but there is in the, in the lexicon, there, I mean, the lexical page, a scripture from Jeremiah that is offered for today's text. I'm going to read a portion of it. Uh, Jeremiah 4 and 22, it says, For my people are foolish, they know me not. They are stupid. They're stupid children, and they have no understanding, and they are shrewd to do evil. Now, but to do good, they don't know. So here, Jeremiah, I wish we had had this one come out today. I just do. Because here you hear God saying, you know, my people are foolish. They're just stupid. Now, can you imagine coming to hear the good news and God's telling you, hey, you're stupid. You're foolish. I remember once I was, a, I was probably 19 or 20, I was coming into my adulthood and I was still very dependent on my father and I wanted to travel to Hot Springs with my sisters. And my father was like, no, you're not doing it. Said, but dad, he said, boy, if you don't do what I'm telling you, you're, gonna not, you're not gonna like what's gonna happen next. And I did something, he said, boy, you're just stupid. And you're not stupid because I said it. I said it because you're stupid. <laughs> and I feel that, that might sound like child abuse, but it's, it's a real story. And it happened because in this interest of knowing and being and having the hidden wisdom, we are now in a moment in time, in 2022, where the pervasion of the paper mill is trying to take away the smell of the eggs. And I don't like it. But something happens here. He said, you're stupid, you're foolish, you don't know how to do good, but you're really skilled at evil. Now, it's hard to imagine being skilled at evil. We don't really imagine ourselves studying evil or maybe studying war, but sometimes we do. But what the text is suggesting to us is that when you are foolish and stupid, it is a perfect breeding ground for the skill of evil. Evil depends on our ignorance. The success of evil depends on my laziness, on my inability to repent or to reimagine or to rethink. So how does this fit the text? Jesus is talking to tax collectors and sinners. There's that word, sinners. Paul calls himself the chief of sinners. 
Now imagine what the good news is to the oppressed. And imagine where we are. Paul calls himself the chief of sinners, and we celebrate Paul because Jesus found him and saved him. But what happened? Paul was a blasphemer. He was a persecutor. He was a murderer. It seems good that, man, the grace of God could save a murderer. He could save a blasphemer, a persecutor. And so to the oppressed, the oppressed feels persecuted. The oppressed feels like their lives are threatened and always in danger. And so you have a contrast here while Paul offers himself, man, I was, a, I was a chief of, I was really good at making people hurt. I was really good at killing people that didn't agree with me. I was really great at helping them feel really bad about themselves and invalidating them. Now, do you feel that energy at all in the world right now? Is it common? Is it, does it seem like it's running rampant? Well, if it's getting strength, if it's gaining momentum, you know why it's gaining momentum? Because stupidity and ignorance is giving it fertile soil to grow. So Jesus comes and he says, and the Pharisees are mad because he's with the publicans and the sinners. So Paul calls himself a sinner, the chief of them, and then there are the sinners here. And Jesus goes into a parable that eventually will end up in the parable of the prodigal son, where the son leaves, gets his, gets his inheritance, and then comes back. But Jesus starts with the coin and the lost sheep. But what you don't hear is the voices of the sheep, the 99 sheep, and you don't necessarily hear the voices of the nine silver coins. What I started to do today was give each of you an envelope with a penny in it and have you open it like right now, so you just have to use your imagination. And realize this penny is so critical to the dollar. In fact, you don't have a dollar if you only have 99 cents. In this day and age, it's easy to forget what the penny feels like because nobody wants that copper coin. It's either digital, it's green, it's a credit card, or it's a checkbook. So there's something about the way we live right now that makes it difficult for us to imagine something that is so small and so feeble being so relevant. I woke up this morning with a pain in my back. I don't quite know why, but I can imagine the rest of my body said, well, my hand is fine, my feet are fine, my voice is fine, my eyes are, well, they're not. Uh, <laughs> I could imagine this. But Jesus is having this conversation, as Paul is having this conversation, so there are two words. Paul calls himself a blasphemer. He says he was really good at it. Do you know that the word blaspheme in the Greek is also translated stupid? Paul calls himself, I was stupid. And because I was so good at being stupid, I was great at killing people. I was great at causing pain. I was great at causing oppression. And here Jesus is, come on, you're mad that I'm hanging out with these sinners? You're mad that I'm hanging out with people that need to have insight? Because look, if anybody needs me around them, it's people who are really good at being stupid. If anybody needs you in this grace of God, this power of the Holy Spirit around them, it is those people who have agreed to give their ground to evil. Edmund Burke is quoted as saying, or he's credited with giving the statement, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. We learned that that's really not an Edmund Burke quote, who was an Irish philosopher. I picked this up. John Stuart Mill made this statement, let not anyone pacify his conscience by the delusion that he can do no harm if he takes no part and forms no opinion. Bad men need nothing more to compass their ends or compass their ends 
than that good men should look on and do nothing. He's not a good man who, without a protest, allows wrong to be committed in his name and with the means which he helps to supply because he will not trouble himself to use his mind on the subject. Where are we today? What is the gospel calling us to do? It's calling us to recognize that while we may be comfortable, while we are rejoicing that we are saved, the sinner or the sheep that's lost is oppressed. The silver coin that's lost has rendered the whole dollar incapacitated. My back needs to get some help and I don't want my heart to ignore it. And this is where we are, people of God. We cannot allow ourselves to be passively ignorant. Paul said in another text, I would not have you ignorant of Satan's devices. And this is good news, it really is, because each of you, each of us, have the capacity to extend this love. What is love except to give from your strength into the life of another, to help that other optimize their reason for being? If we could just stop in this world seeing ourselves as separate. If Paul, when Paul repented, he had a new imagination. He realized that the people he was persecuting were not his enemy. And we desperately need people who are good at persecution to change their minds. You have all that's necessary to awaken yourself to the love within. And all that's necessary to extend that love to a friend. Amen.